And how do we spread messages to people across a wide range of platforms? And how do we communicate either business to business uh, or business to person? Uh, and there's this new Facebook analogy as well. But I think the best way to start is if we go start off with Ian and we go across to Andrew one by one. If you brief description of what you do within the social and cross media uh, industries, and we'll see how the people change. Okay. Right. So I'm into my, yeah, okay, obviously. Okay, so my X Factor moment. So, um, okay, so uh, for the benefit of uh, the people who wasn't here to get bored with my uh, presentation earlier today, um, what my company does and what we do in particular is uh, a blend, well, it's kind of a hybrid really. We're cross media consultants, as, um, we analyze uh, marketing spend within organizations and then we recommend to them the best service channel um, route to market through marketing service channels um, to maximize their return on investment. And then the other side of our business is a um, social media, fully service social media management um, uh, division, which basically um, looks after corporate social media, um, posts, uh, comments, uh, content aggregation, and um, we also, as some of you saw earlier, we run uh, competitions and campaigns and sweepstakes, etc. So um, that's what um, I do. To answer your first question, yes, I am doing Movember, and this moustache is not <laughs> for any other reason than charity. Um, secondly, um, basically adaptive, we're consultants in social media. Regardless of platform, we look at how digital media and communities can evolve and help businesses um, do anything from launching a new product to understanding whether a new design is relevant for their audience, uh, even down to selling more products in the long term and really squeezing the most out of that consumer relationship that they have. And that's across anything from fast moving consumer goods into technology and business to business environments. Um, so I'm really interested today to kind of get people's views on you know, how they build, how they use social uh, networking in the future and how communities are going to be built and for what purpose. So uh, on, ask away in a minute. Thanks. Hi. Um, okay, so our, our company, we basically build communities either for ourselves uh, and then we work with um, partners in terms of you know, monetization of those um, or on behalf of brands. So we work with uh, companies like Adobe. Um, we run a site for them called CMO.com. Um, and the purpose of that site is to educate senior marketing people to um, not just Adobe's proposition, um, but to help strengthen what they're doing um, by providing useful content and information um, to marketing people at you know, appropriate points in time. Um, in terms of community, I go back to 2008, I decided to start setting up groups on LinkedIn. Um, who here is uh, familiar with LinkedIn? Okay, a uh, fair few people. So LinkedIn is a B2B um, social network uh, where people act, can act as individuals, um, but often act representing you know, their business and their biz business interests. Uh, we developed uh, a couple of um, groups that are actually in the, the top 30 on the site, and they have I mean, something like a couple, maybe even a few million groups on the site now. Um, one is called Digital Marketing, um, so if you're interested in you know, internet marketing, it's certainly a group worth joining. Um, that group has a quarter of a million members, um, and I run another group called Green for people who are interested in sustainability, uh, and again, that's about 180,000 members or so. Um, so our, our involvement in social is, I suppose, going back to the example I gave of Thomson Reuters, it's not open. Um, there, um, we create groups within uh, social channels that are invited only, uh, invite only. Uh, but part of our process and part of our engagement is about how you turn them from passive uh, into ambassadors and contributing. Um, and that's something that we've done for a number of clients, number of clients, including Thompson Writers. So coming on to that. Difference, or even you want to chip in and grab the mind when you can. Invite only social media. Where would you do invite only? What's the benefits of invite only? And consumer based or open access 
Where's the benefit for each one? What is the difference that people get out of it? I mean, for us, it's because of what we are looking to do is create um, a club, where, you know, for, for want of a better word, we're creating something, a walled garden. And to get into that walled garden, you need to be able to justify your presence in there. So there is, there is reasons. But we want to use and we want to use the facilities that those channels have without having to build a platform ourselves. Um, and so that has primarily been one of the drivers of create, for us, of creating these wall gardens, these, uh, wall gardens within our platform campaign. <coughs> Okay, um, yeah, from our, can you, can you guys hear me? About, okay, fine, I'll forget my, so, my. so um, from, from our point of view, it's slightly different, so the, the communities that we build are inclusive of everybody, um, but we will use an approach that we like to call velvet rope, so, you know, when you're stood outside the nightclub and they let the VIPs in and you wish you were in there and part of that club, um, exactly, you know, exactly is the same as, as we're saying here. So we'll have big audience that gives us reach, um, and within that audience, we will have um, maybe slightly more of a senior group that we're looking to attract and to work with, and have them, I suppose, desperate to become part of the club. So you want the people to want to. Yeah, so an, an example is that uh, we're running something um, called the Digital Leaders Banquet, um, really for people who are CEOs of um, advertising agencies, uh, people who are direct to a level above at client type businesses, um, and also supply companies as well. Um, and the call to action for them was, you know, we advertised the event, but you couldn't buy a ticket for it, you had to apply to attend. And then we used the process to be able to filter through to ensure that we had the right people. Um, we promoted it uh, initially about a week and a half ago, and we've got 180 people who are registered already who will be coming to the banquet. But ours is slightly different. We we actually do the closed groups for, for a slightly different reason. Yeah. We, we like to look for relevancy. So, for instance, if we're helping a business launch a new product or understand whether the product is relevant for the market, we will, we will source or find people that want to be involved in judging or viewing that product before it hits the marketplace to give us a true review of a product that's relevant to them. Because otherwise what we tend to create is a you know, give us a review and uh, you can open yourself to some uh, you know, inaccurate comments, should we say, uh, let alone some very rude comments on social media. So that's part of the reason we do that. Yeah, well, I think for me, I mean, we Obviously, you know, it's the same with Facebook. If you want to set up a group in Facebook, you just have a, a bunch of friends you want to talk to or circles in Google Plus if you just want to keep your family in that. And, and the same with LinkedIn if you want to set up secure groups and, you know, if you wanted to set up a secure Twitter feed as well. It's all for the reason that you just want that information to be kept within a certain group. Now, your reasons behind that can be quite subjective, as Carl said. Mm. It could be a case of <coughs> testing the market. You know, as John said there, it could be a case of um, you know, having an established elite group, but for whatever your reasons are for setting up that secure group, whether it's business to person, business to consumer, or business to business, is, is entirely up to you. So, um, I mean, generally, we, I, I'll be honest with you, when we, when we consult with our clients, the first thing they say is, oh, you know, we're a prestigious brand, we want to keep a, a nice, secure, sort of niche group. The, the reality is they don't want that, that's what they think they want. What they really want is to share and have a community and have engaging content and conversations. And, and you can manage groups even if they're open. So if somebody's on there as being an objector or somebody on there is, um, you know, uh, as, as one of the guys here was saying, you know, was saying expletives or something that's detrimental to your business, you don't have to keep them on the group. You can ban them or block them out. So um, there's there's not a problem with doing that. So there's, it's, it's a highly subjective reason to answer your question, Chris, uh, as to why you set up your individual secure and unsecure groups. So that's something else actually I'm thinking of is um, if you're in a restricted industry such as maybe pharmaceutical, it would, uh, it would maybe be appropriate to have a private group for people, who are perhaps healthcare professionals, um, as you obviously market the business in a completely different way. And, you know. I think the way of, by having a club is a select band of people, so that with a similar interest or outcomes or wishes or whatever you want to measure it by. How do you engage and manage a conversation within the selected categories? 
Because if it's a club, you don't want them to talk about them as how like you would with an opening group. Do you manage it differently? Um, sorry, shall I start this one? Yeah, yeah I, mean, I, I don't know, I disagree really. I think, you know, what you're trying to do, the, the whole, if we can step back and look at the strategic aspect of setting up a group, whether it's an open or a closed one, it's to either knowledge share or stimulate conversation or start sharing ideas. And that's what the whole premise of social media is about um, in itself. And that's what it really stimulates. Um, yes, there's a lot of crap ideas and there's a lot of crap on social media, but arguably I'd always say there has been a lot of crap even before social media turned up. Um, the idea is to get a rich content and to, to filter through that to get to get a better stimulating and engage, engaging conversation going. So I think um, you know how do you stimulate ideas? You know, it's, it is by putting out questions out that you know as a moderator you have to start invoking questions. You have to be quite neutral. You have to start. Um, asking things that, um, that would stimulate a, a response and a conversation and a discourse. I think the best groups that we run for experience of, of engagement and stimulations are the ones we set up uh, open questions and then we just let the, the people just talk without ever getting involved again and they just sort of stimulate and all of a sudden start snowballing and growing and growing and there's more ideas coming in. You'd love to sort of step into those groups and say, well, I like, actually, I agree with this, I don't disagree with that, but it's better to say completely neutral and let them kind of fight it out between themselves. And fight is probably the wrong word, but discuss it between themselves. And you're, not, you're never going to please everybody with what you post, so, you know, but you, you're going to get somewhere close to that um, if you start monitoring the responses and seeing what engages people. Hence the reason I know some of you guys saw the analytics I put up on Facebook and and, and some of the stuff we did on Twitter as well, you can start measuring which posts actually engage more people, which ones are more interactive with that particular profile of that particular group. <coughs> and they're the ones that you need to really enhance and push forward and drive and drive further forward. So that's that's how we kind of manage it, engaging engaging the conversation. I, I mean, I, my, my view is really I don't ever really want to over-manage anything. I think if I can get to an experience where people within the community are talking like their friends in the pub, I would say I've probably done the best job I could for my clients. Um, a lot of the demographic of the work that we've done in the last six months actually sits with uh, women between the age of 24 and uh, 38. I wonder what that is. Um, <laughs> it's not for a choice, it's just what's happened. And, uh, and what's been really interesting in, in terms of uh, one of the things that Ian said is about posing questions. A lot of the content that we've posted out is quite emotive and the questions that we ask in terms of memories and things that they like. Um, and in terms of brands as well and the relationship, they are very vocal as a demographic, and the conversations that occur between two people who have never met in a community are quite astounding. And the natural virality of those conversations is, is worth, you know, you, you couldn't buy that from a marketing perspective. Um, and there was a question earlier about ROI and how you measure that. And it's really interesting because everyone wants to measure it in a physical, uh, we do social media and we sell X number of products. Unfortunately, social media is just not there for me yet. Um, what we're now doing though is we are still looking at brand awareness and how much more we can we can add to that digital technology to give us some form of, of purchase off the back end of that and you know we start talking about shopper shopper marketing and various other elements but yeah if natural conversation can occur like it does in the pub I'm all <coughs> for it. I think uh, from from our point of view um, with our site Digital Donut. We, and also with the LinkedIn groups, we view ourselves as facilitators. So we really like to facilitate the conversation rather than seed it and, and try to lead it. Um, we create content that comes out of the group um, and also on the site so that we're identifying the experts within the community and it's our job to make those people look really good. Um, we. Um, take their content, we'll publish them on the homepage of our site, we'll feature them as experts and we'll profile them. Um, we also, uh, once a week, write a layer of commentary, so we'll provide expert commentary that's kind of layered up on top of their content. Um, and really that's what, that's what we choose to do rather than um, trying to steer the community in our particular direction, we need to go with the voices that are there. I mean, it's very much very similar for the, the stuff that we've been doing. It's it's a facilitating because what we're what we're interested in is generating insight and ge generating intelligence. And out of that, you know, we facilitate the the conversation. We don't lead the conversation, but facilitate. Try to kind of weed out that intelligence so it can be shared amongst 
um, amongst the uh, amongst the community because the moment that people see that that is happening, trust kicks in, and the the insight and intelligence becomes so much more richer. Now that's not about us like, trying to exploit anything or our clients trying to exploit anything, but that's literally about creating a safe space and then being seen to have facilitated that that, that safe space. I think trust is a key word here within social media. How can you install a sense of trust that that engagement is good for people? You're not just sending a bad message. You're not trying to over and kill it. Well, yeah, the Americans have got this sort of one in six rule, um, which is, again, kind of too normative for me um, as an approach to social media, because social media is by very definition social and uh, not scientific. Um, but they have this, you know, every sort of six posts or every sort of six simulations, you're supposed to kind of talk about your brand as well. So you're not seen as a spanner. Every time you go onto their groups or social media in general, they will just sell, sell, sell. Um, the Europeans, and, and, and particularly the UK, are, are a lot more reserved uh, with all respect than the Americans. And um, uh, one in six is far, far too many. Um, you know, so if, if, if we were to apply their uh, pure logic of, of posting one in six on, on every, every Facebook, Twitter feed about our brand, you'll soon disengage your brand, generically. Um, so to build up a trust, you have to sort of kind of, uh, as these chaps were saying, you have to kind of facilitate. I think facilitation's great if you've got a mature group, because you can't facilitate, you can't just be a facilitator if you set up a group, because no one will start talking. Um, so you need to start that stimulation and building the trust. The other thing is, um, I said before that, you know, we, when we set up discussions and the discussions start to roll, we kind of like to step out of that. That a lot of trust does come in when you have to step in sometimes to not calm the field down, but almost bring it back to a conclusion. And, and people see there's an element of trust. They almost see you as a facilitating moderator. You know, you're there to police it, but in a very sort of diplomatic way. So um, you, it's a question of, of a very sort of um, sensitivity around when to know to step in and when to not. And I think that builds trust within a community. But one thing for absolute sure, it takes a phenomenal amount of effort for anybody to contribute onto social media. So for somebody to actually bother to read your post to start with, and then to actually pick their phone up and think consciously, I feel strongly enough about to write something back about that, that takes a lot of effort. It might sound really straightforward, but all of us have gone through social media and just quickly flipped through it on our phones or our computers, and we just can't be bothered to read everything. So for somebody to sit there and read your post and have a, a view about it, and then post back about it, it takes a lot of effort, and that deserves respect. Um, whether it's detrimental to what you've posted or whether it's an advocate of what you've posted. So I think to build a trust back, when somebody makes the effort to actually have discourse on your social media sites, I think you need to uh, at least acknowledge that. And if it's detrimental to say, yes, I understand you've got a different point of view, etc. Or if it's a quite a positive one, even just a simple tick as a like this is enough to make people feel, actually, somebody's actually listening to me. I've made the effort to respond and somebody's actually said, thanks very much. And coming from a big, a big brand, that's an that's an awfully big thing. So that's that's one of the ways to trust the build up on the social. So we got a slightly different approach. We um we, we looked at trust as a whole scenario about you know initially feeding out, finding a way where people can trust you in the social community. And what we actually found was that the content was the best way we could trust you. Is the quality of the content and the reasoning behind the content being given to you. So the context uh, gave us. A real sense of community very very fast um, for our uh, our community members and sometimes that is graphically creatively giving them something that, that's um, sort of quality content and, and I would say for you guys uh, as students in the room you know creativity for me should always be at the heart of partly the social media campaigning because for me the most successful social campaigns that I've seen have involved really good creative content because they engage people and that's what starts conversation, the stimulus of, of a good nature. And for me, that's, that starts trust, and it's at that point you can start uh, differentiating the conversation. I'm not a big fan of over-promoting on social, um, but I do think it's a necessary evil for many of the businesses that are playing social. So, I don't know a question, how many people follow a brand? <coughs> Why do you follow them? Inspiration. <laughs> Offers, information, inspiration, inspiration. Okay, inspiration. do you trust them? Yes. 
Who do you guys follow? Um, Red Bull. Certain images. Okay. So, you know, in terms of myself, you know, I'll, I'll follow a number of B2B brands because I find them useful. Um, they're producing, you know, white papers, reports, you know, information that I'm interested in. Um, norm, you know, I think more importantly, if, if I'm getting updates from them that in my mind are, are timely uh, and relevant um, and useful to me, then that starts building a, a layer of trust with that particular um, business. Uh, in the context of what we do as well, we, we believe that a community to function properly should also um, function offline as well as online. Um, so we create events that bring the community together. Um, we'll write reports, um, so we might do a round table, we'll generate a report off the back of that, and then we'll syndicate that information back out into our particular audience. I mean, that's, a, that's very much what we do. Um, it, you know, it, it has to work offline. It can't just, it can't just live there. And it doesn't mean that every me member of the community needs to go to it, but the most important thing is that intelligence is, is got from it, and that intelligence can be placed within, or can be made into bite-sized chunks, and over a period of time repurposed. Um, and it will then become a stimulant for further conversation, and will be consumed in, in different ways. I think if you look at adverts now, they, they, you see an advert on TV and it goes, join my Facebook group or follow me on Twitter or something like that. And that can pro prolong a conversation with that brand and other enthusiasts with that brand. What's the best way for companies who want to get that audience and start that conversation to kick it off? Yeah, exactly. Um, well, I guess this leads nicely into sort of the cross media part of this panel as well, you know, because it's not this discussion is not all about social media, um, and as we all know, marketing is not all about social media. So Chris obviously mentioned, you know, TV advertising, and um, it reminds me of when I first saw the World Wide Web being put on a TV. Um, advert, I just thought it was really bizarre. Most of you are not old enough, but in the early 90s, um, that was kind of really freaky, and now it's kind of happening again 20 years later, um, but this time with social media. So, to get back to your, your question, how do you, you know, start building an audience? It doesn't have to dynamically and not necessarily come through social media, i.e., TV adverts, you know, radios, you can have things like print, uh, email marketing, mobile marketing, and all those kind of things can help stimulate. Um, and drive people into your following. Now, whether you're following is social media, or whether you're following is building email databases or text databases for mobile marketing, is really, again, down to the brand and subjective and, and individual um, to each, each company and each marketing's objectives. So, how do you build that? How do you get that audience? And it's all about generating awareness and creating awareness. And it's a chicken and egg scenario, because if you walk into a a brand new company, even even the most famous brand in the world, if they haven't got any data or any background on their target audience, their demographics, their geographics, the sociographics of what they're trying to achieve, then it is kind of a bit of a finger in the air scenario. Who, how are they best going to engage? Yes, we've all got the very stereotypical of social media is all followed by the young and print is all followed by the old, but the reality is, as we were talking earlier, it doesn't quite work like that. You know, it's different for every single brand and every different, uh, different for every single ind uh, individual. So you just need to stimulate, to start with, if you're starting from fresh, you need to stimulate the, uh, the awareness in um, a cross-media um, uh, cross campaign. Now, um, I think you, was, you were chatting earlier, wasn't you, about, or, one, or somebody, got one, somebody here was chatting earlier about doing a, um, a test in the market, a proof of concept. And when you're first starting out, it's a very good way of seeing where your best reaction is to your marketplace. But any of you that are doing research degrees will know that's, that that's just a sample of a huge population, right? So what you get out of that sample is supposed to represent the population. And that is exactly what you do with this proof of concept. Okay, so you're just testing a sample and seeing how, it, how you think it's going to react if you expand it to a larger audience. So you can start off like that with a brand that doesn't hasn't started or hasn't got no data or information. Move on to a company that's much more mature and, and in line with their audience or their potential audience that have information, then you can start measuring which, uh, as, which media channel out of the cross-media uh, toolbox that you've got to use is the most effective. And you, as I sort of demonstrated to some of you guys who was here, here earlier, you can then start measuring it and seeing which ones react with which brand.
But be aware, as I said, it is modular. It changes all the time because people's tastes and personalities change all the time, and the way they want to interact with each brand is different. So it's a very difficult way. So I'm looking this way. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, uh, the only thing I would say is a really interesting question for the room. How many people, when consuming, I don't know, above line media like TV, radio, etc., have actually reacted to seeing a Facebook or any other call to action and said, oh wow, they're on Facebook, I better go and like them, or that's the reason I'm going to go and check them on Facebook? It, was it a TV advert, or you just thought, actually, if they're on Facebook, I'm likely just going to search for them? Well, maybe some, uh, once I heard, like, in, during, I was listening to radio and they said, if you put a like, you may win a Mac. Right. And so, so they bought your like. Yeah, yeah. 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 So <laughs> I think, I think, I guess the point I'm trying to understand and make is that, by the very nature, Facebook exists, and, and as a media set, it, it's it's as big as TV ever will be now uh, in terms of population and numbers. And what's interesting is just by advertising that they exist on Facebook, I don't think necessarily drives someone to like them on Facebook. Um, and in the same way, if you look at media full stop, and I think Ian makes a good point that you know we, we have a really big marketing mix now. Social media is you know blown up, but actually it's probably going to end up being a smaller, concise version of what it is today, and it will just slot into every other piece of the marketing mix. And I think the same for you know obviously where TV sits and IPTV, which internet TV will come as well soon. But, but for me, it's. I don't feel there's always a point when I see that on TV, I think, is that wasted media space in some way, shape or form, it possibly is. If I was to be in a position to say, how do we drive that, I'd be looking at, you know, what's the best device that, as, as John mentioned earlier, what's timing and what's relevant to those people to get them to engage with us across the, re the medium that's right for them. So, you know, if, if it's mobile, if it's TV, if it's, if it's the internet on their desktop, absolutely, that's, that's where we should focus. Okay. You sure? No. No, no, no. Okay, fine. Um, so really, you know, it depends if it's um, if you're looking at a new business or if you're looking at an existing one. Obviously, an existing business has customers, clients, you know, etc. Um, so it's really, I think, step one is segmentation and, and trying to understand who those customers are, why are they customers of mine, what do they look like, etc. Uh, and try to build you know, models of, of your customer base. Um, the next step really is around you know, identification. So where do these people hang out online? Um, what is it that they talk about? What is it that they're interested in? Uh, what insights can I gain from that to be able to use in the marketing campaigns uh, that I want to push out to them um, to, you know, to properly engage the audience? Um, there's various tools out there, so you can use um, buzz monitoring type tools, uh, which are very good. Um, so there's there's tools out there that will um, identify what people are talking about, perhaps in relation to your brand, um, what the sentiment is around those conversations. Um, are there trends or topics that are being detected that perhaps you didn't know about before? Uh, where are these conversations going on, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and they enable you to be able to gain um, insights that um, you can then incorporate back into, obviously, your campaigning uh, and your campaign planning. Uh, I suppose from there, the, the next step really, once you understand the media that they consume and where they are, is um, defining your proposition. Um, from there, really, the, the channels that you're going to use that are most appropriate for delivering your message. Um, constant measurement, as was mentioned earlier. Um, the refinement of, of those campaigns. Um, so I'm just having a look at my notes. Uh, and then, you know, from the understanding and the uh, information you've built up, being able to then optimize um, the campaign to, to be more successful. So how do you manage this tone of voice to get it through a campaign. Do you, do you have a different tone for different brands and different purposes? I, I don't work with lots of brands, no. so um, slightly, slightly different in, in that respect. Um, but I believe that you should be looking at adopting your audience's tone of voice and communicate in the way that they communicate, use the language that they use. Um, also, in terms of search engine optimization as well, or social searches on, on social sites, if you're using the right keywords and the language of your audience, 
course, your content's more likely to get found amongst all the noise that's out there. Yeah. Uh, we, we work with loads of brands, as you know, Chris, and um, it's, it's, it's slightly different than that. It, it, it's more the perception of how the brand wants to be perceived in the marketplace. So, unfortunately, we don't work with Ferrari, but if we did work with Ferrari, um, they would be definitely have a very definitive way they want their brand's tone of voice, either if it's social media, or print, email, or whatever. But one of the best examples to look at is, um, and I mentioned it earlier with a different case study, but it's Bet365. If you have a look at their social media site, it is almost like you're in a kid's playground. It, it's very sort of, they take their, their jokes and they're, they're putting Photoshop pictures together and, and, and it really runs a fine line between what they can get away with. But it's the type of company they want to be received. And if you've seen their adverts on TV as well, it's all very Russian oligarch and you know, get your friends to vote on a bet on this. And it's supposed to be that laddie sort of ladder culture of placing a bet down the pub with your friends and, and they continue that. And that's the attraction and that's the brand image that they want through social media. And, it, and what you make is a very, very good point because from the different brands that we work with, um, whether they're pest control companies, whether they're big event management companies, they all have a particular tone of voice. And one of the things that absolutely personally intrinsically drives me crazy is when you're dealing with a big brand and they say, yeah, we do this social media thing, we have um, a, a, with all respect, a graduate, or we have someone who does it a bit part time. You think you're a hundred million pound company, and you've built years and years of trying to get your brand and spent fortunes on TV, radio, and advertising to try and get this <coughs> Burberry image, the Ferrari image, or whatever it might be, Tesco's, whatever it is. And you're relying your social media brand onto somebody with no marketing or very, very little marketing knowledge to interact daily with customers in their tone of voice. And without any real thought about it, because unfortunately in the UK, at the moment, we still haven't caught up with the curve. Um, so it's a key question, and it's one of the things that actually binds our business closer to our organizations than ever before, because we have to understand exactly how the company wants to communicate through social media. And if you don't understand that, you can make a huge faux pas. Um, and you can start coming across really cool and hip, where the company are actually saying, we want to take them really seriously. So you've misunderstood the brief, you've gone out there and you've almost destroyed our brand to our followers. So which, one, and it's an important thing, you know, you say to the clients, right at the very concept stage, you must take time and seriously, and it's not being patronizing or detrimental <coughs> to them, but you must take time and seriously consider how you want your voice to be, because once you're out there and you're communicating, you can't just wake up one next morning and say, actually, no, we're going to go the opposite way now. Because that's like talking to your friend who you built up a trust with and relationship with, who's really professional and really cool and everything, and then all of a sudden you start being jokey and laddie, and you think, this ain't the sort of person that I, I, this wasn't the person I engaged with, or vice versa. So it's very clear that you need to keep that, uh, that brand image unless you go for a complete rebrand, as LucasAid did with when they went from being a, a, a hospital drink to being a sports energy drink. You know, that's a complete rebrand, complete shift, a complete change. But that doesn't happen that often, and when it does, it's not happen very successfully. Um, so Lucas Aid is one of the exceptions, but um, that's, that's what we find with regards to the uh, brand image. I think, I think what's really interesting about social media, though, is I tend to see a lot of brands go from having a very um, formal conversation with their yeah, with, their, uh, yeah. with their consumers to a completely informal conversation online. Now, there, there's two two kind of trends of thought there for me. Is first, I see it sometimes as a really good thing because you know when you have an informal voice, all of a sudden it makes a brand feel more like a person, and so people feel that they can relate to them. Um, but equally, like Ian says, you, you've got a real concern there where we've already asked people in the audience here, you know, do they like, you know, why did they like the Facebook and They believe in the brand. There's things they like about the brand and the informality of, of that whole uh, conversation can erode over time, you know, that relationship that you have with the consumer. Um, sometimes it's a positive, sometimes it's a negative, I think. Um, but I do see that a lot with, with brands through social media. But I think it's partly because who's responsible for it and how they feel they should be, behave in that realm. And I don't think any of us know how we should behave truly at so this point time. Do you have to spend a lot of time with the people you're building social networks for to educate them about how they need to respond uh, and how they need to manage them. Well, we, we, we manage 
be responses. Yeah. So we don't actually, uh, from our perspective, we don't actually ask the come ask the, the people how exactly they want to respond. Unless it's a very very poignant question, but if it's a generic kind of question like where are you located, what's your nearest store, what time are you open? You know, obviously we don't need to feedback because we take all that off the client's table and we manage that for them. Um, but you're right, at the very, very early stage, you have to get sticky with the client. I know, sorry, it's a bit of a marketing term, but you have to get really close with the client and you have to understand um, you know, the marketing director's objectives, their strategy, what they want, how they want to be seen, their voice, and you do need to spend a lot of time. I personally do, because we work with a lot of brands, so I, I tend to spend a lot of time, and, and the guys do, of actually understanding how they want to be talked to. And it is an iterative process. It takes time um, to get into that, that position where Firstly, the client is confident enough to step away and let you kind of manage their voice, but, but, but primarily that you need to understand how you want to engage with that, um, their audience as well. So it does take a little bit of time, but as Carl said, it's, uh, I've seen it kind of the other way around, where Carl said it's gone very professional and then gone to very sort of um, informal. I've seen brands go very informal, very informal, and then all of a sudden realise that's not the way we want to be. We want, you know, if you let's take Ferrari again. If you engage with Ferrari, you wouldn't expect a response back going, "Hi, kids, how you doing? Everything cool?" You know, <laughs> you're laughing because it's true, right? So you'd expect Ferrari to be ultra professional and you know respond by saying, you know, exactly what you would expect them to say in a in a corporate manner. So, yes, to answer your question, you might personally have to spend a lot of time with the clients to make sure, certainly in the first two or three months, that we are putting across the right voice and personality at that point. How about the financial sector? I mean, it's, it's slightly different for us because because we we only we may only be um, facilitating or working with a hundred people spread geographically. So we're not that we will never get to thousands <coughs> and thousands of people. It will be a small number. Those people will be the key people in that sector, and we will also want people. I mean, to start with, and we'll be wanting to add people. And the tone of voice becomes really, really important because it's you know it might not be, it might live with under a, within a, a wall garden belonging to somebody. So what they that what that that becomes really, really important. What we also tend to do is uh, work with our clients to allow them to get into a position where they can facilitate the community. So I mean some some of this. It is because it is so specialist bits of information. Yes, that we our editorial team has the ability to do this, to do specialist engagement, but over a period of time, it's much better because it's low numbers that they are they are looking after their own their own community, and so we put in the structures to allow that to allow them to take it over. So, really interesting from our perspective, because one of the things we do is we spend three months doing a whole process of marketing analysis. So we will go through a marketing plan with a customer that looks at their business. It doesn't look at specifics of social media or anything. It's a marketing plan. You answer these questions and then we at least understand where you want to travel to. Then what we do is we spend the first three months on a social media plan and we will just do all the insights. I mean, Andrew said it earlier. For me, you, you, you can't do anything unless you start to understand something. So three months for our customers, they tend to look at us and say, well, you're not actually doing anything. Um, we're getting no results. And then what we do after three months, we produce this report, which is very insightful, very deep, and it tells them about all the competition, what they're doing, the voice of their market at this point in time, where we believe we should be targeting. Um, and after three months, we put them on a, an accelerator plan. And that process literally says that we take you from very low numbers uh, into the engagement numbers that are accurate for them. And that doesn't mean lots of followers, that means the right people that's relevant to what they want to do. So so for me, it's coming back to basics. We're getting social for a bit, marketing. What is the marketing plan? And if they don't have one, then then we get, we, we feel like we're doing it. I think that rapid response with, with the groups you run, John, where you have small set groups and then two groups for different things. How do you get that rapid acceleration going? You, you hope it will spread virally yeah. to the right people, but how do you kick it off? Yeah, um, I think you need to make it really easy for people. So when I first set up the LinkedIn group, I made it really easy for them to invite other people. Yeah, um, I when people joined, they'd get a you know thank you for joining, blah blah blah, and they would actually have an invite that they could copy paste if they wanted to send out to other people who looked like them. 
Um, and actually, you know, that I think one helped accelerate the group quite fast. The other thing is, as well, is you need to communicate what the group's about, what the value of the, the group is, um, the types of people that you want to be there, etc. But I, I just think making things as shareable uh, as possible really helps, you know, accelerate things. Mm -hmm. But having good content again, yeah, a good question to get people discussing. Quite good. I joined a conversation last night, which was what's a good conversation to have on LinkedIn. <laughs> sure, Did you see it on Across Media Live? <laughs> yeah. 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 So I thought well, that was a funny question to have on LinkedIn, but uh, but it was really quite a, a relevant um, thing. Mm. So um, what was the conversation? What were the answers? I, I was like the second one in there. <laughs> well, it was quite funny. Okay, so just to yeah. just to generalise, what the, the, the conversation basically said it was on the LinkedIn group, and it said. Um, how do you measure if a LinkedIn group is right for you? And this guy came up with this fantastically wonderful, long, <laughs> complex mathematical formula of times x by the amount of comments over the amount of followers divided by the amount of responses. And some other guy was great, some other guy came back straight away with but all your mathematical <laughs> equations completely wrong. It should be like this, and then he reformulated. And then Chris came on and said, well, why, why are you bothering with all that? Surely the whole reason and premise of joining a group is that you want to join it because it's stimulating conversation. It's, mm -hmm. it's people that are like-minded, your peers on there. So I think your comment was great because it was almost saying, <laughs> it doesn't matter if there's 10 million people on the group, if the content is crap and it's not useful for you, you'd rather join a group with 10 people on it mm -hmm. because it's much more engaging. So. It would be interesting to see if anybody's responded back to you tonight. Yeah, sure. I think there's another part of, of, well, in terms of accelerating your group, is give it the right name. Mm, yeah. yeah. So, and, and also choose names that are search terms. Yeah. So that people are going to be searching on. So, I mean, I went out early and, and bagged all of the, the search terms like fine, you know, yeah, green, mobile, yeah. digital marketing, technology, you know, etc. They are my groups. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that has, has done more than anything else in terms of accelerating. Um, the, the findability of those. Mm -hmm. So, um, one thing, who, let's have a focus, who is on Facebook here? Mm -hmm. Well, let's have a, who's not on Facebook? Yeah, that's pretty easy. One, really, I think. <laughs> I'm not going to go <laughs> Who's on LinkedIn? Mm -hmm. Who actively engages mm -hmm. in LinkedIn discussions? <laughs> Why don't you engage in LinkedIn discussions? I don't know how to use it. Not know how to use it. The thing is, it's, it's not got, the, I think for young people, it's not got a fun fact to the place. Yeah, yeah. I don't like how um, you can It's a business orientated yeah. thing, which it you is. You can't go yeah, through this. <laughs> Do you think it's too business orientated? Is yeah. that no, boring? I think it's, it's too confused. It's full of useless content. It's too confused. Oh, no, there no, are companies that have like five yeah. different profiles, and they're you're not know which one is the real one. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There are people that are asking stupid questions that are not related to anything about the yeah. business factor. Yeah. They're trying to do the Facebook thing, but they're not, and it's yeah. confusing. I think, I think it'd be good to have a little discussion about the difference between business, personal business to consumer and business to business and the different networks <coughs> of that and what you can expect from those networks. Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, that's a, that's a good question. Okay, so um, we have companies come to us and say, um, we want everything. We want Facebook, we want LinkedIn, we want Twitter, we want YouTube, we want Google+, we want Pinterest. We're like, whoa, 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 hang on a second. Why do you want all that? And it's like, oh, well, my competitors are doing that, or I've heard that's what I need to be on, and they're the most popular groups, and surely that's right. No, it's not. I, I don't think we've got any one company that, certainly, I can tell you now, we've got no one company that maximizes all the social media sites. Okay, so it just doesn't happen. So, yeah, let them have, if that's what they want to pay for, even if it's against your advice, let them have everyone they want to join. But I guarantee you, they do not maximise that. Why? Because it goes back to what we were saying right at the beginning. It's about profiling your audience and understanding how you engage. If I want to engage with you guys who are saying that you work with Facebook much more than LinkedIn, you know, that's the type of brands that you will attach to and that's the type of engagement you will have. So it, it, you're not going to engage with a brand on every single social media for the same brand um, across the whole platform, unless you are phenomenally good at doing it. And I, I personally, I don't know if these guys know, but I personally don't know one brand that dominates the top five or six social media sites. And when I say dominates, has a hell of a lot of followers on there and a lot of interaction. 
Cool. So you, your point is very valid, the, the business to business and business to consumer as you are talking about this business to person thing that's coming out of the States as well. Um, because different social media sites do generically target different types of audiences. So Facebook, as you guys were saying, it is more of a business to consumer um, type of uh, platform. And you generally find companies that are selling products straight into the public are much more prolific on things like Facebook. Uh, this is just generic, okay? So we're not as generalization. We're not kind of going into details with each individual brand. But someone like LinkedIn, as you guys rightly pointed out, you know, is heavily business to business. You know, if you started selling business to consumer products on LinkedIn, you probably wouldn't get a lot of traction unless you was a really, really good brand. And then the traction you would get would probably be from people that don't really interact. They're just saying that they're following your brand because they want to know about new products coming out. So it's not really engaging. And that's not what LinkedIn is about, to be honest about. It's more about business to business interaction. Twitter sits somewhere in between. So you can engage with a business to business person. You know, look at Deloitte. You look at people that are business to business. They've got large following. And you look at people like Coca-Cola and Justin Bieber and all those guys who are quite a, a good brand will have a, a huge following as well. So there's a mixture between those. Um, so it really depends on the brand. As, as these guys were saying, everything is subjective. Every brand is different. It really depends on the interaction and it really depends on how you want to engage on that social media. As well, the other thing is, what are you selling? You know, if you're someone like Getty Images, of course Pinterest is going to be a perfect site for you, right? Okay, so you just go and generate that. In fact, I think they've got one of the biggest Pinterest sites out there at the moment. Um, but if you're somebody who, you know, has, say, a, a, one of my clients who's a pest control company, we never set up a Pinterest account for them. So you always have a look at bugs and, 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 and rodents and rats and stuff. So um, it is very dependent and subjective on what you're, you're trying to sell as well. Yeah, I think I, I think the whole thing's really interesting. I think this is where social media is going to change over the next few years. Is that we've seen the emergence of something like Pinterest, where I would say it's quite a niche focus. Um, it is about beautification, about things that you find you like, that design orientated, etc. Um, I think we're going to see more social networks, but with more targeted reasoning behind yeah. their existence. So there are a couple that are evolving out in the US at the moment. Uh, Circle Me is one of them that I quite like. I've been in touch with those guys for a little while whilst they've been beatering. Um, and, and they just, they focus on simple things. Um, so things in your life, like, you know, your like Foursquare exists for check-ins. Foursquare isn't like Facebook. It integrates with Facebook. It's just about, you know, the evolution of that was, you know, guys in Texas going out, I think, and uh, going on bar crawls, telling their friends where they were. Um, it's very simple and it works. And it has a purpose. And I like the idea of things existing to have a purpose rather than, where I believe Facebook's going, which is this all-encompassing, it's a, to, you know, it's a, it's a social site in the, the true personal social community sense. It's evolved into a business tool, and it's trying to be all things to all men. And now it's a platform that's so big. Um, is it just too much if I want to communicate with my friends and speak to my family and show them what my life's about? And I, I think it probably is now. But as smaller sites evolve, I think I think that will be the most sensible thing. And it's about targeting at that point. Um, a few months back, there was uh, an interesting interview with Martin Sorrell, um, WPP, um, and he was asked, if, "Is the future of advertising Facebook?" And his response was, "Obviously, you know, certainly not." Um, what he actually believed was that we were start seeing an emergence of much more niche social networks, where you know, where as a consumer or as a business person, I go to to get the information that I need and connect with the people that, uh, <coughs> um, that I have more, much more in common with. Um, I would tend to agree with that comment. Um, you know, what we do with Communitize, as I said earlier, is build B2B communities. Our first one is a site called Digital Donut. Um, we went from zero to 10,000 members in uh, about 18 weeks. Um, and, you know, we're getting really good growth and traction with an audience that we're trying to support. Um, we're obviously planning to put up other sites on our platform um, and the way I'd say the way that we handle data and the way that we describe our world is kind of critical so we describe everything in the same way so that we can match um, for instance a job to a profile uh, based on one the information that someone has completed about themselves and you know I, I'm good at um, I want to know about etc um, another layer being um, context, so the content 
um, that uh, makes up their profile data. Uh, and then the third part being behavioral. So what it is they start doing on the site, maybe they start reading more information around mobile. Um, over a period of time, we build up uh, a very clear picture of that individual. We also know that they would exist across other sites of ours um, so that we can target them again in a, a much more relevant and personal manner. How can you use that information to target people? What, what benefit does it have? How scary is it for you to have access to all this personal information uh, on people? Um, I wouldn't say it's, uh, it's not scary uh, at all. Um, you know, if, if I'm interacting with a site and I'm spending all my time, you know, I don't know, reading about super luxury yachts, um, you know, I'm going to surely welcome more information coming to me about, you know, that particular thing. Um, I don't, don't really, yeah, I, I don't really see that there's an issue with privacy there. Um, it's not really personal data, it's, it's their be behaviour. How about can I sorry? Can I just add on to that? Um, it's a very this is a very this is something always cropped up in the last sort of two or three years, especially when Zuckerberg decided to uh, um, float his company. But he's going, oh, where's going to happen to our data? Um, let me tell you now, before social media ever come about, if anybody's got a credit card or a debit card, those companies have got far more information and data on you than social media sites have ever had. Okay, so this has been around for 25 years. So they know where you shop, how much you spend, exactly what you spend it on where you go, what you earn by your outgoings going through your credit card. They know everything about you. They know more about you than you would ever want them to know. But they don't exploit it because they will scare you if they start sending things through the post going, oh, I noticed you bought, bought two, two cans of uh, Red Bull out of, um, out of the local uh, Majestic wine shop. You know, Would you like an offer off of Red Bull? You're like, How on earth do you know that much information? Of course they do. They know everything about you that is happening. So, that's been around for years. So the stuff that social media are doing and people are getting this paranoia about, well, I'm not going to post up a picture because it's going to be Facebook's property and I'll never get it back. It, it's just oh, it's just way, way over the top from where we actually are already. So, so there is a common perception of fear. And if you've got a Tesco's club card or something, they know everything you have bought. Absolutely. But the benefit is you can go to Tesco's online and it tells you these are the things you're probably interested in. Yeah. So, it, it's, okay, there's what you want. It's a culture mindset. Yeah. And you're absolutely right. Right, because if I was to do that to you before online marketing come along and I was to walk up to you and say, Chris, I just know exactly what you buy every week in Tesco. You told me to fill your shopping trolley. I'd go, whoa, freak out. You know, how do you know all that about me? You know, but now they've slowly put it into things like online online grocery ordering and stuff. You're, and it's becoming beneficial to you. You don't mind. I think that's where it comes out. It's got to be a benefit. Well, we're about personalization and a better user experience. I'd rather log into the site and see stuff I'm interested in than have to go and find it. I was just going to say, what's really interesting, you mentioned Tesco. So <clears throat> behind Tesco is a company called Dunham Humby, who, who own, manage, and do all the data for Tesco. I mean, Tesco's actually own them now. Um, what's really interesting is <coughs> the clients or the spies that they then deal with, which are food manufacturers, where I spend a lot of time, they, um, they don't actually freely give that information about the individual's away. The way that Dunham Humby sell the products is, what are you looking to achieve? OK, great. Give us your objectives and we do that for you. So the data is always so contained within Dunham Humby and Tesco's world that it doesn't leak out and it is absolutely about personalization. But do you think that's because data is key and it is the nest egg? Because if you give that absolutely. away, yeah, you give yeah, that away, you no, sold no, the crown no. jewels, haven't you? Really? Absolutely, and it, there'd, there'd be no value. I mean, the likes of Tesco's need to hold, hold that data. But I think equally as well, data collection laws now are far more powerful than they have been, and I think it's only a matter of time if that was ever to happen, we would see a, an enormous legal case. Because yeah, I would say, how much has that to do with law, and how much has that to do with their ethics? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that I, would, I don't know. Yeah, I think one day we'll get to answer the question, maybe. <laughs> I think uh, I think the biggest fear that people should have is like where LinkedIn got hacked, and like the passwords all got stolen. Probably not a worthwhile one to do to LinkedIn because they're probably quite they're business people generally and know what they're doing. But I think that's the biggest fear, isn't it? Where somebody hacks into it. Well, I, think, I think, think you've got that anywhere, like you say, Anonymous. You know, Sony had it, didn't they? Yeah, yeah PlayStation yeah. and certain banks have had it. You just, it's going to happen. And you've either got to trust the system a little bit and, and go with it, or you've got to step outside. The choice is yours. But it comes down to, if we're looking at cross media and social network things, 
comes back to the trust element. Can you trust that network to manage your data? Because we're not just dealing with the big four now, of Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and so on. You've got <coughs> lots of smaller ones. Can they be trusted when we get all these specialists? Can, can I just add something? You, you said social media and cross media. Because mm. I is this session about cross media, and is it any different? It's all blended. Well. I, I know, but I, do, I just think I just like to sort of just re-emphasise that word cross media, and just see if it makes any difference. Sure. Yeah. Cross media is uh, yeah. There is a difference. Cross media is looking at uh, marketing campaigns that use different types of media techniques. So um, anything that uses one, oh, sorry, two or more um, marketing channels to get the message to the consumer or the business is considered a cross media campaign. So. If you're going to launch a product to sell in iPhones, for instance, and you decide to do that for an email campaign and a TV advert, but they run concurrently and they're trying to do the same campaign to sell the same product at the same time, well, not necessarily at the same time, but within the same time frame, then that's considered a cross-media campaign, because you're mixing medias within the same campaign. I think in the context of the question about data and privacy, though, I think it all, to me, it's very much the same. Um, is that regardless of the touch point or the type of media, there's often some data exchange involved, and that you do have to be aware of, you know, can I trust them, these people, can I not? Um, you know, I think this is all about choice at the end of the day. You, you as a, a consumer or, you know, as a business recipient of information, you have to choose whether or not you can trust them, you want to trust them, and the amount of information that you are willing to give. If they're asking for more information that's necessary for the data exchange, then you question whether you should bother doing that. Um, if it's a name and an email, very good to give away. I think, uh, you know, for John and Carl, they brought up some good points earlier, I and mean, we talked talk about the future of TV, internet TV, talk about data. You can, uh, obviously TVs are out now that you can plug your, your cable, your, your LAN cable straight to the back of, so these guys can monitor exactly what you're watching and, you know, when you switch your telly off and things like that. So the future apparently is going to go somewhere down the line that they can tailor make adverts to what you watch. So if they put on an advert for Heineken beer and you happen to switch over, they think, well, that's not really the advert we should be promoting to you. So next time we're channeling an advert that's more specific to you. So maybe we do a red wine advert, let's see if we switch over again, and they tailor it down. So it becomes more profiled um, targeting um, of TV advertising. This is really happening. It's happening in, it happened in, a, oh, come on, forgive me, but it happened in a city in the States very, very recently with a um, real estate company who wanted to sell their uh, real estate to a select amount of people through internet TV advertising. Actually happened, check it on Google, I'm not joking, so it's really live. So when this actually gets better and better, and, and they can profile what you're watching, they will be able to beam into your TV exactly the adverts that you're interested in, exactly like John said, so if he wants to see you know, he obviously earns a lot more money than me because he's got some luxury yachts, but if he wants luxury yachts come up, um, and those TV adverts will come into John's house. Now, there's a big problem around it at the moment. I, I did read up on it, I'm not an expert on it, but I did read up a little bit on it. The big problem is that if you've got a family of kids and stuff and you're all sitting around watching TV, um, you don't want beer adverts coming on while your little children are watching on TV. So TV is a mixed audience. You can have obviously more than one person communicating with the TV, all five of the family. I don't know if that happens anymore, but all five of the family you did when I was a kid sit around and watch the telly together and what adverts you watch. So dad don't want to be sitting there watching My Little Pony adverts and the little kids don't want to be sitting there watching beer adverts. So they've got a little bit of a problem. They're talking about doing time thresholds, so when it gets to nine o'clock they think that sort of demographic's gone to bed so they start putting up different adverts. And this goes back to what Carl was saying and you were talking about with the, is there's a Facebook thing on an advert, do you go off to your computer? And sit down and go and join it. You won't have to in the future. What they're saying is they'll be able to put that up. You might have seen they tried to do this. Was it Waitrose? I think somebody tried to do this with a QR code at the end of a T. John Lewis. John Lewis, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, anyway, it didn't quite work. But you'll be able to go onto the um, TV and literally it will come up with let's take John Lewis. It'll be tailor made to you. It will be just what you want, and it will say, follow us on Facebook. You just click a button on your remote control. You don't even have to get out. You'll see. That. It's kind of talking about futures, it's kind of the way that, that TV advertising and data and information will be useful going forward in the future. What they're going to be working on is face recognition. I was going to say, so again, <laughs> recognizes yes. who's in the room. I, IBM have developed a face algorithm, um, and they're using it already, in, even in some shops, where it will know when you walk through the door, 
it works out age uh, and some basic demographic information, but it works out who's coming into stores and starts profiling them. They're going to embed those into TVs. You see them in digital displays now in some of the shopping centres when you walk past. Do you think they can handle a moustache like that? Though? <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. No one can handle a moustache like that. <laughs> it doesn't actually uh, picture your face. It, picture, yeah. it measures coordinates That's right. on your face. Yeah. It's the same way that they work with passport and camera systems. And it actually does it for a body movement. You've got it. So, yes. for that. so it connects to the beginning of it. Smart TVs will start to uh, end uh, as well. Uh, we'll move on to the subject of gamification. So to encourage, if you've got a TV advert, it's going to encourage me to go to some kind of social network or to a website or something else using AR to like we had yesterday to go to a game. There's something where if you're going to offer something back to the consumer, uh, it encourages people to go there. There's a real benefit of being there rather than just chatting to people. So what kind of things are good to offer back as a reward? It could be information, it could be a game, it could be monetary. What things work well, do you think? Uh, again, I think that's totally dependent on the audience. You know, it's uh, the type of people they are and who they want. Um, I mean, interesting enough, uh, if you look at gamification and uh, the way it's evolved over time, and in the States, this is particularly where it kind of came about, really, with things like Scavenger, which was similar to, to Foursquare and Guala. Um, it's about putting people in a scenario where they feel part of something. Again, it came just that engagement, I think. Um, there was, I mean, both Pepsi and, and Coca Cola over the years have done things where they've done treasure hunts. So people going to various locations and they were checking in and they would get rewards once they build up the point system. Um, to me, that's just uh, an yeah, extension of brand loyalty. And that's what gamification really is good at doing is engaging that person and it's kind of giving them the benefits of firing that delivery method. I like gamification, um, I've been involved with some technology around gamification, um, there's very few companies that are truly maximizing that at the moment, um, but I think the next couple of years we'll see, we'll see that a lot better. It's about prolonging so engagement, that's important for business sites and things like that, it, it's attracting people back to it. Uh, so the consumers you can give a discount or something, but on the business side, how can you people wanting to return to that. So it's fresh on their mind, well, I must go and look at that. I think it's what John said, you know, it's information, white papers, things like that. You know, I think there's some ridiculous stat that on Facebook, 80% of the people that follow a brand never go back to the page again. Yeah, that's so, right. Yeah, it's ridiculous. I mean, it's, um, so, but yeah, I mean, if we move away from Facebook and, and answer your question directly on business to business, it is about peers, it is about sharing knowledge, and yeah, that's what drives people back. Ask yourself the very question why you commented on cross-media thing last night, it was because you had a strong opinion about what they were talking about, and, yeah, it was well. and, in, my opinion, and, and in my opinion, you were right, but um, you obviously felt stronger about it than I did, because you bothered to make a post about it, but, um, so you're sad, like. yeah, but, 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 you, but whether you're happy or sad about that conversation, you bothered to make a But what's opinion. good about LinkedIn is because, the way I set it up, you can offer for different options, but it sent me an email, there's something starting that seems to be of interest to me, it sends me a link to that, and I can see on the email what that conversation is all about, and I can decide to click on it or not. So it's bringing me a message where it's I am. Proactive, isn't it? Yeah. In terms of uh, gamification on our sites, we, we have a uh, number of uh, bits of functionality that we can switch on to start gamifying things, actually giving people badges, etc., etc. I'm not 100% sure that we're going to go down that route, um, but I do like the idea of appending a score to an individual, so based on their interactions, their commentary, things that they've posted, etc., because that enables you to better identify who the experts and the contributors <coughs> in the community are very quickly, and go to the right person um, to get, you know, let's say it's advice from search engine marketing. <laughs> Uh, this guy's done, I don't know, 100 blog posts about it, uh, has done brilliant commentary. Um, and therefore, it makes sense that he is scored higher than someone else who hasn't. Um, I mean, so that, that really becomes that, useful. It? I actually think LinkedIn's appalling um, at doing it. Yeah. So, um, there is a new function on LinkedIn, which is, um, it essentially is what's it called? It's called a test. It's not testimonial uh, endorsement. Yeah. Yeah. And that's gamification. Yeah. So you land on someone's profile. Is this person really good at this? 
One of mine is donut licking. So I, I'm kind of making it a bit of a mess. Well, I thought I'd make a little bit of a mess. But actually what that's about is adding, that, that is, the reason they brought it in clearly is that their search algorithm is appalling. Um, and they don't really know enough about the data. So it's a human there uh, that sits on top acting as another filter. In the same way that Google uses circles and Google Plus, it's exactly the same, but it's poorly executed. So I think it's a good point. It's all about data. Yeah. You know, at the end of the day, we're sitting here talking about all these different social media sites and what they do, and cross media and mobile marketing, email marketing. The whole thing is about understanding your audience and selling them the product. There's no point. I use this anecdote all the time, but there's no point selling double blazing to somebody who's already got it. There's no point selling red wine to someone who's tea time. <coughs> so, you know, it's about understanding your audience and that maximizes your return on marketing investment because you're going to target all the people who drink red wine with your red wine And, you know, if you want to put a game around red wine drinking, let me know and I'll join it. But, you know, that, that will make more sense to the people that are engaged with that brand. So it's the key to it is all about data. So any questions from the audience? Um, what are your thoughts on forced advertising? Um, as in, like, you know, no videos on YouTube, you have to watch an advert to watch the video. Or, I don't know if you've ever seen things like, uh, have you ever seen a program called Charlie Brooker's um, Black Mirror, where the people pay to not view advertising? Is it actually Charlie Brooker? Yeah. Because exactly. I follow him on Twitter and I think he's brilliant. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's got a lot of interesting insights into how the future will be. And, um, that he did one of his programs was basically, you know, when you've got no money, you've got to watch adverts, <laughs> and if you've got money, you can pay not to see it. Right, and yeah. it's kind of going that way a lot with things yeah. like YouTube and filtering in, isn't it? So just, just one of yeah, the, the whole thing about, I mean, look, let's, let's look up to the chase here. You know, social media is set up and they make their money purely on advertising, okay? <laughs> Whether that's Facebook, Twitter with their sponsored tweets, <coughs> you know, LinkedIn with you know, their profiles and what they're sending and stuff, and, 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 and obviously, um, um, uh, YouTube as well with their advertising. Now, the whole reason, if I could just bring it around to Facebook, because it's probably the most um, prevalent example to give you, because it's all happened very recently, i.e. in the last six months. Uh, they floated uh, on the on the stock exchange, and they, obviously Deloitte got it completely wrong, and it's all sold their shares at $37 a share, uh, which made Bono out of YouTube very happy, because I think he ended up earning about a billion dollars overnight. I think he made more from that deal than he did out of his entire music career. Um, so that goes to show that was great for him. Um, but literally, over the course of the next three or four days, their shares went down to sort of $20, and then now it's somewhere pottering around about $16. Cheryl, the, the COO of, of Facebook, sold her shares at the first opportunity, which was Monday. Uh, she still walked out with about $7 million, which was nice, but she was originally worth something like $21 million when they first floated. So why, why has this happened? You know, why have they got it so badly wrong? Well, it was all down to the advertising. If you look more specifically, it's all down to this, okay? Most people now access um, social media sites through their phone. And if you go on Facebook on your app, you won't see any adverts. How good is that? If you're selling, if your prime income or turnover is coming from selling advertising space. So what are you gonna do? Walk up to Adidas, walk up to Nike as Facebook and say, yeah, you can buy some advertising space, but most people interact with the Facebook app, they won't see it. Well, great, you know, how's that gonna help? Now, Twitter are laughing. Because Twitter have just got, you know, promoted tweets, very easy to use, very interactive, don't have to do anything to their GUI, it's completely set up all ready for it. YouTube will laugh it because if you want to access a video, whether it's on my computer or my mobile, like you said, the advert will come up, I've got to wait five seconds before I can skip it, or sometimes you can't. But, but that's only gonna get worse, isn't it? Exactly, yeah. worse. And especially the same digital TVs and Absolutely. It's directly to you, it's going to be... It's 97 or 98% of their income. It's not going to change in any short order, yeah. you know. So there's, in, in my opinion, it's like, I think it's, you know, it's part of the beast, really. And if you want to be in that social media world and you want to be interacting on that type of social media site, you're, it's going to, it, it's what, it's what, how they fund themselves. And it's until somebody comes up with something phenomenally um, uh, groundbreaking, and I think that's the way it will be. <coughs> you could open up a rant with me on this question. Yeah. <laughs> basically. For or against? So, well, <laughs> totally against. Um, right. So basically, recently, uh, I started using the 4AD app for some time ago, so I used to watch it. <laughs> One advert, you can have to do it yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It was a consistent Heineken advert for about six months, which was really annoying. Uh, never made me buy any Heineken, I would have to say. Um, what was really interesting, uh, now I've noticed it's gone from literally one advert 
to probably five or six adverts often. And, and for me, it's just too much. I can't skip them. And what I'm finding is I'm just getting frustrated with the content. Um, and for me, it's just not a good experience as a consumer of TV. Um, so I am against it. I totally understand, because I'm in the business, that we do need to do this. But we need to do it with choice, uh, as much as we can. Um, yeah, and I agree, you know, Twitter's got a very simple model and it works. Um, you know, whether that will change, we don't know. But Ian's absolutely right, the way Facebook has done it as well, they missed out on monetizing mobile, which was their mistake. And now, I don't know if you guys are using the latest Facebook app, you'll start to see other people's page likes forced in your face every now and then. Um, that's because they're just trying to monetize something at the back end and it's just not going to work. So, I yeah, wouldn't mind being you see a, a brand new Facebook app soon. Yeah, we, they are developing it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, it, and it will be yeah. advertising heavy. Yeah. And uh, because that's why they lose the money. Yeah. I'd rather see it to the side, you know, when you press and you scooch us across and you get to see your list of all the pages that you like. If you want to chuck some adverts in there, show me pages that I might be interested in, adverts I might be interested in. Give me the choice to choose whether I want to be advertised. Yeah, rather than force advertising. Rather than force, yeah. We're just going to sign people off. Yeah. Okay. Leave it a revolution. People don't try. <laughs> did, you, did you see on Twitter that when, uh, when, the promoted, when the promoted tweets first started coming out and they were sort of stuck across the top of your timeline on Twitter, people start reporting them as spam. <laughs> <laughs> so these people are, advertisers were paying these fortunes to have a promoted tweet put on your tweet line and all they were getting back was this is spam, can you take it away? So, yeah. <laughs> I was just um, wanting to go back to something you were saying earlier about the uh, mind of the data and understanding what they, what they know of you from, from your debit card transactions. I was um, I'm kind of very worried and I was looking for uh, reassurance from the panel as to how, how much information do they, do they actually know? About They're not going to use it down targeting you. They're going to use it on an aggregate level. To understand their audience and to understand the customer. Yeah. Because uh, Ian was talking about you know <coughs> transactions and you'll be surprised how much they know about you. And I'm here in London for the week, and my wife's back in Wiltshire, and I had to buy for purely academic reasons condoms and uh, <laughs> <laughs> yesterday for my presentation. And I'm now very concerned. What about the lunch rate? Um, because I'm staying, I'm staying here in the same hotel as Eva. I, I'm now concerned about the conclusions and well, the differences the, that are being drawn from this data. Yeah, yeah, and, and rightly so. But no, there, there are data protection laws, of course, you know, not just UK, but European-wide. And they're all different as well. You know, I, I did a bit of work in India, quite a bit of work in India a couple of years ago. And the data protection law there is, is absolutely a joke compared to what it is. But, well, it, there is, but unfortunately, it's just really, it's, it's, it's really bizarre. It's um, completely different, but I digress. To go back to your point, yes, they know. They know that your wife, where she is, they know you're in London, they know exactly what you bought, they know where you went. I'm not getting any reassurance. No, you are. <laughs> I'm not here to reassure you, I'm just here to tell you the truth. I'm more concerned about that. And again, the US is very different. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, don't, but don't, I think like John said, they, uh, and, and the experience I had, I, I worked with a major credit card company about four years ago, a huge credit card company, um, uh, which are effectively a bank, and they, um, we were talking to their market department, and, and it, of course, we went in there and said, you've got a plethora of rich data. Yeah, we can go out and attack all your, maybe attack's the wrong word, we can go out and speak to all your uh, credit card holders, we can, you know, tailor make it, and blah, blah, blah. They went, no, yeah, yeah don't do it, because it will scare them, and they get worried, and you, you know. So it's that, as Chris was saying earlier, you know, it's that build that trust first, and when it becomes useful to somebody, um, then start sending that promotion. But all those little boxes you tick when you um, when you order a credit card that says third party, can we send you information? If you if you don't if you do tick them, then um, and, and you want third or you un don't untick them, whichever way it is. But basically, if you want if you don't mind them sending, sending your data to third party, they will sell that condom to a condom company who will put you on their database and you will get something through the post about do you want to buy some condoms? And you're just like, where did that come from? How on earth did they know I did that? And then you say you've only had yourself to blame. Exactly, there you go. So. If, you, if you want reassurance, though, Ian, the best thing I can recommend in my position is you take pictures of how you use those products and post them on Facebook. It's fortunate that I have no Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're in trouble. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, there, there was um, a program a while ago where it took individuals Google searches and they, they traced down who it was and where they lived and they went and knocked on their door. Well, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't just from your search for it. If, if, you've got, if you've got two minutes, go on YouTube and uh, there's a thing that's just recently come on in the last couple of months and it's a Belgium illusionist. 
and uh, it's gone viral, so it's a really big thing. Sorry, I can't remember what it is off the top of my head. I'll email it to Chris and maybe forward it on. Uh, but search for something like Belgium, Belgium are losing this. It's, it's really new. It's got something like a couple of it. You, you've seen it, right? It's yeah. got a couple of million hits. Yeah. It's unbelievable. And they just will these people off the street, don't they? Literally say, like, come and see this illusionist. He's a mind reader. You think, oh, it's a bit of a Darren Brown sort of thing. And as the viewer, you're not really aware of what's going on. It's going on for a couple of minutes, and he's saying, uh, okay, let me think. And he's going, yeah, you've got a red motorbike. Nice. And you've seen it as well, yeah. right? Okay, yeah, you, you've got this. And, and the people are going, yeah, do you know that? And they, yeah, you sleep with three different people at the same time. Yeah. Seriously, oh, he says that. You know, he's going to that level of detail. You're selling your house, and then all of a sudden, they drop down these black curtains, very similar to this, and there's people, all they're doing is on a radio mic, found out that person's yeah. name, and they're searching all the, all the internet. So all that information was out there about them. And he just pretended to be a mind reader. So. Do you think that uh, the video was a fake? I mean, actually, like, what they want to tell is true, but the video was actually fake and they were actors. Well, the one is... You cannot see, like, the one, I don't have a credit card on my Facebook, that's not true. Well, no, no, no but the one that really made me think there was something a bit moody about it was the one where he said to the girl, you're sleeping with three people yeah, at once. Yeah, you know that? And you would put that on Facebook, or would you? Yeah. No, you would put, I'm sleeping with three people. He's one of them, though. Yeah, he was probably one of them. Yeah. But all the other stuff, I mean, there was things like, you know, you're selling a motorbike. Of course yeah. you put that on one of your things, you know, and your house is up for sale at a quarter of a million euros, you know. But it was just really well, that, scary. That's always depends on how you put your account set. Exactly, yeah. Because you're going to see anything. That's a good account. point, yeah. But that goes back to what Ian was saying, you know, it's all about security and make sure you tick the right boxes and, and stuff. But, yeah. So I'm going to draw this to a close. I think we've chatted on for a while. But a really big thank you to Andrew, John, Carl, and Ian for a, a great day. If anyone's got any questions or an email, I'll leave my cards. <laughs>